Good morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. It's an enthusiastic response over there. Uh, Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. We're glad to see all of you here with us. We know there's quite a few people watching on Zoom this morning, so hello to all of you. And hello to all who are watching this on YouTube at a later time and, and place of your choosing. As the church gathers this morning, obviously we do so in ways in which we're, would have been foreign to us uh, before 2020 as we gather in various, through various media in different places at different times. But it serves as a reminder to us that the local church, RPC, is part of a global church. And we're part of the church that exists and is gathered to worship God all across the world at all various times. But we gather in the name of our one Lord, our one God, one Spirit, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we gather here this morning, we're going to begin our worship with a, uh, with a, a passage from 1 Peter chapter 2. You see that on the screen behind me, and you see it in your bulletins as well. We'll read this responsively. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we are grateful that we are able to worship this this day. We're grateful you've set aside one day in seven to put aside our earthly labors to focus on you, worshiping you, fellowshipping with the saints. Regardless of how we do that, through what medium, in what location, at what time, may we join together in one spirit to sing your praises here this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
please remain standing as we confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? seated. You see in your bulletin there that it's the time that we're going to receive some new members, so I'm going to ask the five uh, new members if you would come forward, sort of walk around this way and up the steps over here, uh, stand in front of Tom, because we'd rather see you than, well, we'd rather see you, so if you could just come up here. <clears throat> And while they're doing that, if the elders who are present with us, if you could make a receiving line of sorts uh, over on this side of the stage. It's always one of my favorite days of the year when we receive new members into our, into our congregation, into our church family. Um, it's just a, it's a sign, a very visible, tangible sign of uh, God's goodness and kindness and provision to us. I'm going to have you stand just so that everyone in cyber world can, can see you guys. Um, 2020 has obviously been a year <laughs> like no other. Uh, so normally we do a new members class January, February, March, and then we receive new members and we introduce them to all of you sometime in April. Um, we're about seven months behind, uh, as you can see, because just as the class was winding down is when everything started shutting down. And so these Poor people have been in limbo for quite some time, but uh, they faithfully went to the new members class. They've been faithfully attending and doing what they can ever since. Uh, they've met with the elders to give their testimony of faith and to uh, take their vows at that time. I guess sometime, I want to say that was in July maybe, and we finally got around to that. Uh, and then it's just been, it's taken a while to get to this day, but thank you for sticking with it. And we're, we're glad that you are a part of our church family uh, we're glad that it's now, um, it's for everyone to see now. Uh, these, these folks are now part of, part of us, uh, members of the church. So we have Eddie, Beth, Rob, Tiffany, and Deb. We, are, we welcome you to our church. You've already uh, confessed your faith. We all did with you in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, but the questions that we ask of you, we've already asked them of them. They confess their faith before the elders of the church. That's when they actually become members. That's my little lesson in Presbyterianism. Um, but we do this publicly now for them to affirm their faith and testify to their faith to Jesus as they answer these questions. First one, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in God's sight, that you justly deserve his displeasure? and that you're without hope except in his sovereign mercy. And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest on him alone for your salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Yes. Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ? And do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourselves to the government and the discipline of the church and promise to pursue its purity and its peace? Okay. So at this time we'll... Read a verse as an encouragement to you, and you'll receive your certificate of membership. 
And then we would normally do the right hand of fellowship. We'll be doing right elbows of fellowship. So you can uh, kind of work your way down the line there with the elders. Let me make sure I get the right one here. Deb, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Welcome to RPC. Tiffany, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Welcome to RPC. Rob, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Welcome to RPC. And then for Eddie and Beth, um, Beth, from Psalm 30, verse 11, you turn my wailing into dancing and you remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. Welcome to RPC. And here's your... And Eddie... For you as well, Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Yes. Welcome to IPC. Let's stand as we continue in our worship of the Lord Jesus.
We do want to welcome uh, each of you to our worship service today. Uh, those present with us physically, uh, those who are uh, watching online live or later on on uh, YouTube. Uh, if uh, you want more information about the, our church, you can find that online. And uh, you can also uh, register your attendance online as well. This time we'll go before the Lord together in prayer. just want to draw your attention, first of all, to the Family Matters for Prayer and Praise on the inside back cover. Um, you see the, the people listed there. There was somebody who uh, came in later in the week that didn't get printed in time, but um, Catherine Melundo was in a kind of a scary car accident. Uh, is doing okay. She's at home recovering, but please continue to pray for her as well. Um, Obviously, many of us are heavy in heart for different reasons uh, these days, and so we're going to begin our time of prayer just in corporate, silent prayer together. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, many of us come here this morning with heavy hearts, just with the news in the world and all the uncertainty and all the anxiety and all the tribulations and trials that people are going through these days. Lord, many of us have particular people that we are burdened for. You know their names. They don't need to be spoken aloud. But Lord, we are thankful that you are a God who sees, you are a God who cares, you are a God who hears your people when they cry out to you. Lord, we pray for this church. We're so delighted and grateful for five new members that we received here this morning publicly. We're grateful that you continue to bless our PC in that way. We pray for them, that we would be a blessing to them. They would integrate into our body, our local body here that they would serve as you have called them to serve so that all of us may be built up together in Christ. Lord, we pray for our church during these difficult times when we're spread out and we're not able to gather together as we are, as we are accustomed. We pray, Lord, that we would still be unified, that our focus would still be on you, that we would still take seriously the call to love one another, to bear with one another, Lord, we want to pray for our community as well, this larger community. As many of us see the continuation of uh, the spread of a virus and every day learning of more and more people contracting the virus and threats of closures and shutdowns on top of all the political turmoil as well and the financial difficulties as well. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray that you would heal it, that you would sustain it, that you would use even this time to draw people to yourself. People would turn away from their earthly idols that have made promises and promises and promises that have all come up empty and turn and said to the living God whose promises in Christ are always yes and amen. And Lord, we pray for our world as well. Lord, we pray for the leaders of the nations, you would give them wisdom so that we might live in peace. We pray for the parts of the world where your gospel is not known. And we pray for the courage of the church to go forth with boldness and clarity, to speak the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. Lord, for all these things we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
So our scripture reading this morning is, once again, from Colossians uh, chapter 1. <clears throat> We've been looking at verses uh, 15 through 20. Our family uh, used to go on uh, some trips on the Skyline Drive when I was growing up, and of course, when I became an adult and had some children of our own, we kind of did one of those drives down the Skyline Drive and the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it's this winding mountain road with very few exits um, and many, many stunning vistas. Um, The thing about the Skyline Drive is it's hard to estimate your time. How long is it going to take you to get from here to here? And it's kind of not the point of driving on the Skyline Drive, but since I'm sort of time-oriented, I uh, had thought like, oh, well, it'll only take this long. And it was at least double that because of all the getting in and out of the car and stopping at the scenic overlooks. And, and also the curves in the road are pretty sharp. You can't speed down. Uh, the Skyline Drive, if you're in a hurry, get off the mountain and get onto I-81, and then you can make some time. The past uh, few weeks, we've been in the book of Colossians, and it's kind of like we've been on the Skyline Drive, as opposed to I-81. We've been looking at verses 15 to 20, and we've had to slow down because there's a lot of scenic overlooks and there's sharp curves in the road. The first overlook that we came to was in verse 15 where we asked, who is Jesus in relationship to God? And we're told in verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God. We spent time at that overview overview, just looking at how Jesus is the exact representation of the being of God, and so to see him is to see the Father. And then we came to another overlook, which was vast in its scope in terms of how far you could see. And we asked, well, who is Jesus in relationship to the created world? And we saw that the last part of verse 15, that he's the firstborn over all creation. For all things were created by him in things in heaven and on earth visible or invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And we saw that he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. This morning we come to another overlook, and actually a series of overlooks, beginning in verse 18, and we ask, ourselves, uh, Paul is really teaching this to the church, well, who is Jesus, not just in relationship to God, and who is Jesus, not just in relationship to the created universe, but who is Jesus in relationship to the new creation? And that's what 18, 19, and 20 are about. Listen to God's word, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now there's a lot of curves in the road today, a lot of scenic overlooks, and a lot of things that Paul is teaching here about Jesus that the Colossian church and our church needs to know. There are a lot of key words here. It's packed. It's very dense. uh, And they deserve our attention. And that's why we're on the Skyline Drive and we're not on Interstate 81. Um, I'm just going to go through verses 18 to 20, and I'm really just going to take a phrase at a time as we walk through this so we can gain some sense of understanding of what exactly Paul is saying. First, he says that Jesus, he is the head of the body, 
the church. Jesus is the head, not just of the Colossian church, but the church. The word here is ecclesia, very common Greek word to, for church. It's where we get the word ecclesiastical from. And it always means, whether it's in the Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament or this Greek form, ecclesia, in the New, it always means the gathered or the called out assembly of the people of God. And in this case, I would say, whether the church that's already gathered in heaven or the church that is gathered on earth, gathered by God, gathered by the great shepherd and brought to himself throughout all time. He is the head of the body, the church. Now notice Jesus' relationship to the church here is described as the head of the body. We're all familiar with this kind of language when we come to the scripture, so we, we sort of just move right over it because we think that we, we get it. Um, it is a familiar image in some portions of scripture the body language has much more to do with our giftedness. You know, we're the body of Christ, all different members, different parts, different gifts, and yet there's this mutual dependence upon each other. It's a focus on us. Okay, we're all tied organically to each other through Jesus, so much so that we can say we belong to each other. Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 teach that very clearly. Those were the earlier writings of Paul, the letter to the Corinthians, the letter to the Romans. Um, but here in what is about A.D. 61, 62, as he writes to the Colossians and also to the Ephesians, they got their letter um, as Epaphras was on his way to uh, Colossae. <clears throat> Paul here brings out a brand new aspect of the church, new dimensions of this sort of body language where he says that Christ is actually the head of the body. <clears throat> and the body is the church. And he is the head. The head here is not simply, you know, one of many parts of the body. As 1 Corinthians 12 says, you know, the head can't say to the hand, I don't need you. You know, or the head can't say to the eye, I don't need you. Okay, that's, that's more sort of our dependence on each other. Here, the head is the supreme authority through which is carried out in his body, his church, all of his purposes and all of his work. We are his body, his hands, his feet. We are his touch on the world on the communities we live in, on our families, on each other here. See that I, I cannot do true ministry apart from the head. And neither can you, otherwise we have a decapitated ministry. And that's not a very pretty picture, is it? In fact, Paul says that in chapter 2, verse 19, as he criticizes some of the teaching that's going on in the church, some of the false teaching, he says, this person has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow, but this person isn't because he's decapitated. Okay? He's not connected to the head. So when thought of this way, think about it, we really are in union with Christ because he's the head and we're the body and just like anyone you see in this sanctuary the head's connected to the body so you're united to Jesus in that image Paul says in <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verses 22 and 23 he says and God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. <clears throat> now that's not an individualistic picture of me and Jesus. That's not a sort of just this me and Jesus and 
I come to the garden alone, and it's just him and me, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. I'm not saying we don't have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. We do. But this is a corporate picture of us. Okay? We are his body. I'm not his body. We are his body together. We walk with Jesus and we serve Jesus and we trust in him that he can accomplish things. He can accomplish life-giving things through us because he's life-giving. He can accomplish powerful things through us because he is powerful as the head. Um, All of those things come about because of our connection to Jesus himself. That's why Paul says in verse 29, he says, To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which works so powerfully in me. You see the connection there to the head. We walk by faith and we serve in faith because his power works through us as we serve. There's probably, you know what, I meant to have a hymnal with me. And I'm like, no, no, there's, I have one in the sanctuary. We don't have hymnals in the sanctuary. But you know that well-known hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee. And the verses just go through, like, take my hands and let them be, you know, instruments of your love. He takes all the body parts in that hymn and says, let, let us, let me be Jesus, as I'm connected to him, I am his body, his representation on this earth. But look what else he says in verse 18 as we <clears throat> are on the skyline drive. And there's another scenic overlook. He goes on to say this about Jesus. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. The word beginning is in Greek is archai, from which we get the word archaic, something that's very, very old. But what does it mean that he's the beginning? The word is out last week in verse 17 that he's before all things. The sun precedes the beginning of creation. The sun is eternal. We said there was never a time when he was not. He has always been even before creation itself. The word beginning does remind us of creation because of those, you know, one of, some of the most famous phrases in the Bible, in the beginning, right? That's creation language. But see, here it refers to the fact that Jesus is the beginning of a new creation, a new humanity. Christ is the origin and the source of the life of the church. And it bursts into life in a phenomenal way at his resurrection from the dead, which is why it says here, he is the first, as the beginning, he is the firstborn among the dead. Jesus' resurrection begins a whole new race, a new humanity. It's called the church. We already came across the word firstborn uh, when we saw that word used back at the end of verse 15 uh, in terms of his relationship to creation. And we saw that in the Old Testament, the one who was born first wasn't always the firstborn, right? I mean, the firstborn was actually Jacob, not Esau, all right? And you see that pattern through the scriptures. Solomon wasn't the firstborn but he was the firstborn, okay? It's a title of honor and preeminence and superiority. Now, Jesus isn't the first one to rise from the dead. Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath. Uh, Jesus raises a widow's son. He raises Jairus' daughter. He raises Lazarus from the grave. But you see, those were not resurrections that lasted. Those people had the unique privilege, if I can say it this way, of dying twice. Okay? 
Good title for a movie. You only die twice. It can be a little club in heaven, you know, and it's going to be like, you know, Jairus' daughter. It's like, oh, there's Lazarus. Hey, hey, Lazarus. Yeah, we, <laughs> we both know what it is to die twice. Not too many people are able to actually say that. But see, Jesus' resurrection's different. It's a resurrection by his Father to a permanent and eternal body, and it's a prototype of the resurrection that all his followers in faith will receive. Okay? It's a body that can never die. Never. And in that sense, you see, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. It's a title of honor and supremacy of his victory over death, but he also is the first one to rise in this way, which is a guarantee for us. He's the creator of a new humanity of people who will never die. There's a sense in which you will never die. You will, unless Jesus comes before that. But Jesus said, before he raised Lazarus, I'm the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe that, he says. So Jesus proved his present power and future power over death in the resurre- his own resurrection. Where, O oh, death, is your sting, is what he says. Where is the eternal separation from God that death was supposed to create. Where is it? Nothing can now separate us from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ, not even death. Anybody say amen to that? Good. It wasn't just Herb. It was all of you. Good. Jesus, as the firstborn from among the dead, has within himself the resurrected life. Okay? And his people share in that life through faith as they, the body, are connected to him, the head, which is why Paul says in chapter 3, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ, past tense. You're already united to his resurrection. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your heart on that. That's your perspective. Let me tell you, that's an overview that's more amazing than the the Skyline Drive. Okay? Set your heart on things above. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Take that perspective. So being the firstborn from the dead and the beginning of a new humanity, Jesus has the ultimate place of honor and authority to rule over all creation. The old creation, which he talks about in verses 16 through 17, but also over the new creation, which is why the next phrase is that he, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. By the way, that is one of the refrains of these six verses, all things, you know. By him all things were created. And then he lists a whole bunch. All things were created by him and for him. He's before all things, okay. And here he says, so then in everything he might have the supremacy. So you see, Jesus rose from the dead. Not just for your justification, as Romans 4.25 says, but so that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, his resurrection has to do with him, too, not just you and me. So that he might have the preeminence over the old and the new. It's a beautiful picture. Then Paul brings us to another scenic overlook. And overlooks so high and broad that it gives us an even bigger picture of what's going on with Jesus and his ministry. He says in verse 19, 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. For God was pleased. Whenever the scriptures talk about the pleasure of God, God being pleased or him delighting, in nearly every context it refers to his electing love for his people. His sovereign will and his pleasure, which is beyond our wisdom to understand, in relationship to his people and his creation. What was he pleased to do? Well, first of all, he was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the incarnate son, the one who came to earth. The ESV translates this, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. It's probably a better translation than the NIV that I'm using. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The word fullness is not a very common word in Paul's writings, but he uses it a lot in Ephesians and Colossians, and he, you know, both these letters kind of got sent around the same time uh, to Asia. <clears throat> Um, the word fullness may be a word that the false teachers were using. We're not positive. But if it is, Paul is hijacking their terminology and using their terminology to talk in the most truthful way about Jesus and his exclusive and sufficient role in salvation. Fullness for the false teachers may have been the whole set of intermediaries that there needed to be between God and his lowly creation. And, you know, God has to stay away from it. So he needs this whole set of intermediaries to sort of make creation and run creation because he has to be distinct from his creation. And Jesus was one of the highest, according to them, perhaps, but you need to have all the mediaries if you want to have the fullness of God in your life. And if that was the case, the false teachers were saying, Jesus is wonderful, but he's not sufficient. You need more. You need fullness through all the intermediaries. But Paul is saying that Jesus is completely sufficient. Paul says here, <clears throat> he says here, um, all that is in the nature and the being of God, all that he is, is found in the incarnate Son, in Jesus of Nazareth, the one who walked on the earth, lived to be 33, died and rose again. That, that Jesus who was on the earth, the complete being of God, all his attributes, his spirit, his wisdom, his glory, are perfectly displayed and present in the incarnate Son. God, in all his essence and power, has taken up residence in the, in the incarnate Jesus. And so Jesus is God in all his fullness. Now, that's almost redundant. I mean, if you have fullness, you're full, right? Paul almost makes it superlative through the redundancy. He says, in all the fullness, in all his fullness. Uh, says it again in chapter 2, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. <laughs> it's obvious this is really important. Okay, The sufficiency of Jesus, the deity of Jesus means that he is Sufficient for all that he came to accomplish. It's not like some of God was in Jesus. All the fullness was there. And he goes on to say that if all the fullness is there, chapter 2, verse 10, then you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over the body. So your connection to the head Jesus with as the body of Christ. You see, if he's the fullness of God then he fills you with his nothing less than. You don't have to go on some spiritual journey to find something else than the gospel to make you full. 
The gospel of Jesus is enough to fill us, which is why he says, and we read this earlier already, in Ephesians 1.22, he placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. It's a beautiful picture. <clears throat> However, this relates to the false teaching we don't know. Um, we, we don't know that um, it was exactly uh, as I described it, but it could be something close to that. Um, but we do know that this idea of fullness is actually an Old Testament concept. It's used in the Old Testament in the sense of God filling the universe with his glory. Okay. Jeremiah 23, 24, do I not fill heaven and earth? Psalm 72, 19, may the whole earth be filled with his glory. The, full, the word fullness is used with the word in conjunction with the word dwell. Okay, it pleased God, right? <clears throat> verse 20, or verse 19, it, it, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Um, the word dwell, that's a significant Old Testament word. Um, it's a significant New Testament word as a result. If you attended the adult Sunday school class last week that Kevin taught, um, he taught it on the screen because he was teaching upstairs, but it was a phenomenal class on the dwelling of God. I don't know if that's on our website or not, but it should be posted there for access because just a 35-minute lesson just on the, the dwelling of God and the significance of that um, and... and it was the glory of God, you see, that filled the dwelling places, the tabernacle, and then the temple. It was filled with his glory in the Holy of Holies, where the mediation for our sin through the blood the high priest brought in, where all that took place. The word for dwell, however, in Colossians 1.19, is not tabernacle, as it is in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's a temporary dwelling. Jesus was on earth for a time. Now he's in heaven. Okay? But here the word dwell is, is the sense of a permanent dwelling. All the fullness of God, not some, all, according to God's pleasure, would dwell forever in the eternal Son, the God-man. Jesus Christ. There's one more thing that results from God's pleasure. Okay? It pleased God, verse 19, to have all his fullness dwell in him. But it also pleased God, and it's connected to it grammatically, it also pleased God, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Again, the phrase all things just runs through all things, everything. Okay? All things is qualified here. All things, whether all things on earth or all things in heaven. It was the Father's will. It was his pleasure through the Son in whom all the fullness dwells. It was his will to reconcile to himself all things through Jesus the head, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Where reconcile implies the presence that something's off, that there's alienation. If I came up to you after church and I said, so how was your week? And, or I said to you, how are you doing? And you said to me, well, I'm doing much better. That would imply that you weren't doing so well before that, right? The word reconcile implies that things weren't so well before this happened. And as you read the scriptures, the, the narrative of redemption, there's four kinds of alienation that come through the fall. There's alienation from God, the creator. That's why we're cast east of Eden. Okay? There's alienation from ourselves. Like we don't even understand ourselves. Do you understand yourself? I don't understand me. No, I mean, I know me, but I don't understand everything about me. 
We don't even, we don't understand why we are, why do I react this way in that situation, okay? Why am I like this or that? How come I'm not more like this? Why haven't I grown more? Well, there's so much we don't know about ourselves. We're alienated from ourselves. Only, that's why we say, search me, oh God, and know me, okay? Because I'm not exactly capable of that. I'm also alienated from others. That's what the fall does. It alienates people, which is why in the Ten Commandments um, we're told really in positive ways, not just negative ways, about how we're to love our neighbor as ourself. But there's also alienation from creation. That's why you sprain your ankle or you get thorns or diseases. It's why there's death. But creation itself is alienated. The world, it's not, something's out of kilter with the whole creation that was described so beautifully that he's before all things and in him all things hold together, but it really wasn't getting to the fall because when the fall comes, some kind of a rupture takes place. Okay? Romans chapter 8 kind of hints at this when it says in uh, verse 19, it says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. It's a part of redemption that, cre that impacts creation and will impact creation in the new earth. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In Star Wars, A New Hope, which was actually the first movie, now it's the fourth movie, but it was the first that came out. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi at one point says, I feel the disturbance in the fourth. You know, and, uh, you know, the Death Star had exploded a planet with, which was inhabited by many people, and, and Obi-Wan is like, I can, I can feel the disturbance in the falls. When Adam and Eve rebelled, when they sinned, there was some kind of a cosmic rift, a, a rupture in creation in relationship to the Creator, and creation itself is somehow bent and disoriented, and it's not properly related to the creator as it should be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's what sin does. And in Jesus, it says here in our passage, through his blood shed on the cross, that decisive event, it's the centerpiece of human history, God has done something on a cosmic level to restore harmony and to realign what is out of line. So God's pleasure, his intent, is to reconcile, to restore to order in the broadest sense possible what was ravaged or torn apart in the fall. <clears throat> so verses 19 to 20 that we're looking at this morning as it talks about reconciliation, it's not really talking about reconciliation on the human level. I mean, it, it includes that, but it's talking in a much bigger picture. Uh, Kevin already preached on verses 21 to 23, and in 21 and 22, he, he brings this to us. He says in 21, once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And there is the gospel. <laughs> right there is the gospel of reconciliation. Okay? But when he introduces it in verse 20, where we are today, he's talking about big picture reconciliation. Notice that the rift is reconciled by his blood shed on the cross 
which brings peace. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. But the peace that he's talking about here, the peace that the cross brings, before he applies it to believers, to the Colossians, to us, in 21 and 22, it applies to the cosmos. All things, heaven or on earth. And the peace here is not necessarily a willing acceptance of peace that Jesus brings. Rather, it is a peace that is imposed upon, forced upon, all those who oppose and wage war against God the Almighty. That's the kind of peace he's talking about here. Peace here in the sense of pacification, not like in pacify someone to soothe them or give the baby the pacifier, but pacification in the sense of enforcing a peace, subjugating things to an unwilling enemy. The powers and authorities that he already described. It's not a glad acceptance of peace. It is the inevitable, forced recognition of the authority of the one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has achieved victory in the cross and resurrection. Now, to illustrate this, you can just think of Jesus in his earthly ministry as a foreshadow of it. He go and he... He's going to cast out demons, and the demon says, oh, I know who you are. And Jesus says, and I'm going to say this in the biblical way, he says, go to hell. He tells them what to do. And they do it. They don't have a choice. It is not a glad submission to the will of Jesus to be cast out of the person which they indwell. But they have no choice. Jesus calms the storm. The storm doesn't say, no, I want to keep raging. The storm listens to him. Has no choice. Jesus speaks to disease, disability, darkness, even death. And death is forced to obey and to retreat and withdraw. Each miracle of Jesus is a declaration of his kingship and his lordship his authority over everything. And at the cross, where his blood is shed, where the debt of sin is paid for, and where he rises victorious over the penalty of our sin, there is a permanent subjugation of everything that's opposed to Jesus as the Son of God, because he is Lord, and he just proved it. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, And he is Lord. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess. Whether they are glad about it or not. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ. Is Lord of all. God was pleased. God was pleased. To do that. Through his son. Which is why in chapter 2, when he talks about the cross and the meaning of the cross, in verse 13, that, you know, we were dead in our sins and he forgave us all our, our sins and he canceled the written code with its regulations. He goes on to say, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them by triumphing over them by at the cross. Okay? So there's something going on at the cross besides the darkness and the storm that came and besides the paying the penalty for our sin, there's something going on at the cross that's even bigger. It has to do with the entire universe and all the powers and all the authorities. He made a public spectacle of them. He just went... And they were subjugated to the Son. Colossians 2.20 
This is an application. <laughs> Since you died with Christ, and to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Those things are toast. They're dead. They're gone. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse, verses 3 and 4. So when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. You see, the cross and the resurrection that follows is God ex exerting his power even over unwilling participants who are not glad about submitting. The universe, in that sense, has been reconciled in that heaven and earth and the disorder, the upside downness of creation, okay, is restored to its created and its determined order. The universe is again under its head, so to speak. And cosmic peace has been established. Now, you know as well as I do that this is an already not yet in the scriptures, okay? We can read passages, and we're out of time, where we can see that, that Jesus will put all things under his feet. And when he does that, you know, that's when the end comes, okay? And death is finally defeated. So there's an already not yet to this. The notion of subjugation was not unfamiliar in Roman times. Victory over those enemies who were hostile did not mean that they were done away with or finally destroyed. Those enemies continued to exist, but in pacification, which is why we call it the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. So not everybody was glad about it, no. People bristled under it, but they had no choice. So with Christ, Pax Christos. What's the application? Well, those who are in Christ, you can't be harmed. <laughs> Christ subdued the power. Walk in faith with that this week. That he really is Lord. That he really did win a victory. That he really did make a public spectacle of them through his death on the cross. Let that feed your soul. You cannot be harmed. Right. Secondly, don't go back to serve the old ways and the old man that depends upon those principalities and those powers, because they've been destroyed. Galatians 4, now, 4, 9, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, see, Paul's a Calvinist, rather, <laughs> now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? And then... In our passage, Colossians 2, verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. There's a lot of false teaching going on around, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Don't go back to that. Because Jesus has won. And he is Lord. Let's pray. Father, we, we praise you for your lordship. Um, we, we praise you uh, for the grace of being connected to one who is life, in whom is life, and in whom our life is found as we're connected to you, the head. Be with your church, we pray. May we be your body on this earth. And may we walk in the confidence of the victory that has already been won. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is, O Savior, Precious Savior.
If you'd extend your hands for these words of peace, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you all. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. few announcements before we're dismissed today. Um, there are some photo directories that have been printed out, uh, so you have some physical copies of those, and they're out in the narthex, kind of on the, on the table against the wall here. You also see in the narthex uh, some bags laid out. Those are for our Christmas in November um, campaign project. Uh, you see it in, the, in your bulletin as well as on the screen behind me. Uh, basically, it's an opportunity to send Christmas cards and gifts to all of our missionaries, um, including the ones overseas. So uh, our encouragement is to drop cards into those bags. I believe there's 10 bags out there. So if you think of it this week, go out and buy 10 Christmas cards, sign them, and put them in next week. Next week is the deadline for those. Uh, Sunday school today. Uh, most of the classes will go on as normal. You'll see them on the back cover of your bulletin. The adult class will be in here beginning at 11 o'clock, which is about 10 minutes or so. Uh, the youth class will meet up in the youth room as normal. Um, the toddlers will, will there'll be people over in the toddler room for the toddlers. And then the children's class, which is approximately kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, they will be having their class online today. There will not be an in-person class for the children's class, K through 5. But all the other classes will uh, go on as normal. Um, I believe that's it. You have a blessed Lord's Day. You're dismissed. Thank you.